Thank you very much, Nancia. And we are now roaring along and our next speakers are uh, two lightning talks. So we will do the two talks together and then take the questions at the end. And so our first uh, talk is from Danny Cribb. And Danny, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danny, and I am a PhD candidate from the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia. Today, I'm presenting some of the risk factors for Campylobacter jejuni and coli in Australia from a case control study that we recently conducted. For context, Australia has a high rate of Campylobacter infection with between 120 and 140 notified cases per 100,000 population per year. Taking into account underreporting, we estimate that there were nearly 359,000 cases in the Australian community in 2019. We recruited 571 cases with culture confirmed. Uh, Campylobacter infection from states and territory health departments in three states on the eastern part of Australia between 2018 and 2019. We determined species from cultures that were whole genome sequenced. Of these cases, most were infected with Campylobacter jejuni. We note that the cases of Campy coli were slightly older and more likely to be male. However, these were not significantly different. To understand the risk factors, we recruited 586 controls that were frequency matched for age, sex and location from notified cases of influenza within the six months prior to interview. We identified factors associated with both an increased and decreased risk of Campylobacter infection, but I'll focus on the increased risk factors today. All of our factors are adjusted for age group, sex, location, and season in a multivariable model. We performed the same analysis on all Campylobacteriosis cases and the subsets of C. jejuni and C. coli cases. The results presented for all Campylobacteriosis cases except where the individual Campy species is identified. So the use of proton pump inhibitors, which are a type of medication that reduce stomach acid production for reflux patients, is associated with an increased risk of infection. Patients often use PPIs on a long-term basis and overprescription is a known problem. PPIs work by increasing the pH of the stomach, making it less acidic, which accommodates Campylobacter growth and likely allows enterics through the stomach into the bowel. This mechanism makes it a biologically plausible risk. PPIs as a risk for Campylobacteriosis is not a novel finding with other case control studies and systematic reviews from around the world reporting similar results. The adjusted population attributable risk of PPI use suggests that they are responsible for around 13% of all Campylobacter cases in Australia, which equates to about 46,000 community cases in 2019. Moving on to chicken, we identified that eating cooked and undercooked chicken were strongly associated with Campylobacter infection. Chicken is a well-known reservoir of Campylobacter and regardless of how often it is consumed or how it is prepared, it remains a risk across species. Chicken is a commonly eaten meat in Australia with 34% of Campylobacter infections likely due to eating chicken. According to our 2019 estimate, this equates to around 120,000 community cases of Campylobacter. You can also see that undercooked chicken was very strongly associated. However, we have a high level of uncertainty around the point estimate due to fewer cases and controls responding to this question. Animal related risk factors included contact with chicken feces and ownership of puppies and kittens. Importantly, animal exposures do not remain statistically significant when restricted to C. coli. However, the uncertainty around these values is likely due to a lack of power within the C. coli data set. We observe the association for young pets in particular, and this is likely related to a higher carriage load of pathogens associated with a developing immune system and lack of toilet training, and this risk wanes as the pets get older. Finally, some delicatessen products carried an increased risk for infection of C. coli, including consumption of deli meats and chicken pate. As these factors did not remain significant for campy in general, 
or Cetaduni, it is possible that C. coli has an increased presence in these meat products. Few case control studies of Campy have differentiated risk factors between species. As discussed, there are some differences in risk factors that should be explored in future studies with higher power. And from here, we aim to conduct a more detailed analysis of the whole genome sequencing data from these pathogens to allow us to better understand the driving factors of Campylobacter in Australia. And I just wanted to thank the Campy Source Project team uh, for their assistance with this project and to everyone in the audience today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Danny. And knowing that you're in Australia, thank you very much for <laughs> making it to this conference. No worries. <laughs> here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll go right on to the next uh, speaker, um, Alicia, if you're ready. Hello. Hello. So our speaker is Alicia Manzanares Penderosa and um, Pedrosa, sorry. And um, take it away whenever you're ready. Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Well, so hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia, and I'm a first uh, PhD first year PhD student in animal health at Cresa Irta, a research institute from from Spain. And first of all, I want to thank to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work uh, on Campylobacter contamination of chicken livers. Okay, so as you already know, Campylobacter is the most frequent foodborne uh, zoonosis in the European Union, uh, having displaced salmonellosis from the first place. The latest data published by EFSA indicate that more than 200,000 cases of Campylobacteriosis were reported in 2019. Uh, however, the number of confirmed cases represents only the 2% of the cases. The real incidence is estimated in 9 million cases per year, and this high incidence creates a very high cost in, in, uy, sorry, uh, in, in public health and loss of productivity. The main source of Campylobacter, Campylobacter infection is the handling and consumption of contaminated chicken meat. However, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, also Campylobacter uh, colonizes the intestine. There are extraintestinal strains that can reach other organs, such as the liver, and this uh, may also pose a food safety risk, considering that uh, this is a product that is often um, undercooked or less cooked than the chicken meat. It should be noted that the prevalence of Campylobacter in livers can be high, with prevalence of more than 80%. It has also been estimated that between 19 and 52% of livers served commercially in the United Kingdom uh, don't reach 70 degrees during cooking. Uh, in, at this temperature, the survival of Campylobacter is between 48 and 98%. Given all of this data, it isn't surprising that uh, several outbreaks of Campylobacteriosis have been, have been confirmed worldwide attributed to the bad handling or um, insufficient, insufficient cooking of the chicken livers. There is a lack of information on the occurrence of Campylobacter in chicken livers in Spain. Therefore, the aim of this study was to determine the prevalence uh, and levels of uh, Campylobacter species in chicken livers from two slaughterhouses in Catalonia. Between 2019 and 2020, 56 flocks were sampled. Three carcasses per flock were collected randomly during the evisceration of the animals. From each carcass, uh, the liver and the zika was sampled. So overall, we analyzed 168 uh, samples of each kind. From livers, uh, we sampled the external surface and the internal tissue. And with the methods that you can see here, we obtained qualitative and quantitative data. And from the Zika samples, we obtain uh, qualitative data by direct streaking on CCDA agar.
Uh, here we have the results of the Campylobacter positive flux. We consider one, one flux positive for each kind of sample if at least one of the three carcasses was positive. So uh, considering these uh, three types of samples, we found a high uh, prevalence of positive flux, almost half. And furthermore, in most of the flux, the external liver was contaminated with Campylobacter, specifically 80, 87%, which denotes an important cross-contamination during the processing. However, if we focus uh, on the internal liver, we can see that the prevalence uh, was reduced to 52%. The, the European Union regulation for Campylobacter in broiler carcasses sets a, a limit on the proportion of positive flux as well as the maximum Campylobacter load. Taking this regulation as a reference, we ranked our samples in these three categories. In, in our samples, in our samples, we found 40% of external surface with contamination levels exceeding the regulation limit, compared to 53% uh, that have a lower Campylobacter load. For, for samples from the internal tissue, the scenario changed with only 77% of samples exceeding the maximum levels compared to the 92% of samples with low bacterial load. Here we have a relevant data. Uh, while, the external, while the external surface contamination with Campylobacter poses a risk during the handling, the low bacterial load of the internal tissue reduces the risk of for consumers, even uh, the liver is undercooked. Despite, despite the prevalence of contam contaminated internal tissue is about 52%, the bacterial load is low in the 92% of the cases, so the risk is reduced. Regarding the Campylobacter species identified in the different types of samples, in all cases, uh, Campylobacter jejuni was the most common. Also, in the Zika samples, we found Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli in similar proportion. The difference were higher in the samples from the internal liver. And also, in all the three sample types, we, there was a small proportion um, there was a small proportion that were positive uh, for both species, Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli with the prevalence being higher in the external liver samples. In summary, according to, to the results, this data highlights uh, chicken livers in Spain as a potential source of human campylobacteriosis, uh, not only due to the, to the campylobacter prevalence, but particularly because of the high uh, bacterial load of surface liver. Further research is needed to determine the potential risk of campylobacteriosis due to the consumption of chicken livers. And that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Danny and Olivia. Um, I think we'll take questions in the order that the, the talks were. Danny, are you still present? Okay. So, um, Danny, there, I, I might have missed this, but there's been a question on um, relating back to the PPIs, and uh, I think the data was that the 13% um, or came in as sort of population attributable. Did you say what proportion of Australians um, are on PPIs, and in particular how that breaks down between males and females? I haven't included that uh, in my analysis so far, but there has been a recent review uh, done using a study in Australia called the 45 and up study, and that looks at the number of people that have been um, prescribed um, PPIs and as well as their hospitalisation rates. So I'd be looking at that data. Um, so that's by Chan et al, I believe, if, or Chan et al, sorry, um, if people are, are interested in looking at that. But yeah, we'll be looking at the results from that study to, to um, yeah, uh, add to ours. <laughs> yeah. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Alethea, um, we've had the same question several times. So it, it relates to whether you've looked at what sequence types or whether you've done any genome sequencing to compare the um, those strains that were present either on the surface or inside the liver versus those in the seeker. Okay. Uh, well, um, not now. We are we are planning the new steps uh, to make with these strains. Uh, we know that we have to make uh, more studies and continue continue searching information and comparing information of these strains. But right now, we don't have any more information about that. Okay, and another question actually relates to the um, the CFU uh, loads. So, Adele asks, is the current regulation uh, related to carcasses, or does it include? Is it related to liver as well? Uh, okay, this this regulation is only related to the carcasses, but we we use this reg this regulation and to make a, a little a little classification or a, um, a form to to compare uh, the different type of samples that we have. But this regulation is not related to specifically to livers. Okay. Thank you very much. I think thank on so that we, we are at time and back to Nicole. Yeah, so thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you very much for uh, all of the speakers. Okay, our first um, presentation is going to be from uh, Nafis Asan from the Child Health Research Foundation in Bangladesh. Good morning. This is Nafis Asan working as a senior research officer at the Child Health Research Foundation, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Warm welcome to my presentation session. Today I'll present on the risk factors for campylobacter among pregnant women and their newborns in rural Bangladesh. You already heard a little bit on the background of our study from Nikon Sharkar's presentation earlier. I just wanted to add that campylobacter was recently recognized as an important cause of diarrheal disease among infants, and it can transmit through multiple pathways. As you can see in the picture, campy transmission can occur via human, poultry, or animals, and even through environment. But our knowledge still limited on the sources of transmission to infants. And these limitations brought us to aim for such an objective, which was to identify possible routes of campylobacter transmission to young infants in households and communities. To achieve this goal, we designed our study in such a way where we could collect all potential human and animal samples along with epidemiological data from three different visits. At first visit, we enrolled pregnant women at their last trimester and collected baseline data from the mother through survey questionnaire. We also collected stool samples from the pregnant mother, sibling, and all the animals or poultry available in the household. Then we performed our second follow-up visit at infant's birth within two weeks time. Here we have collected newborn stool samples along with mother and sibling samples. We also got newborn's information from the mother using newborn questionnaire. After that, at infant's six month of age, we have been conducting inline follow-up visits to collect all the samples exactly like the first visit. Here again, we collect data on mother and infant through questionnaires. Besides, we do collect some additional samples whenever any infant become campy positive or in any diarrheal episode. Now, here comes the results of all the samples collected from the community. You might be a little surprised to see all these colorful boxes. Actually, each box indicates the households with human and animals became campy positives. We can see 77 households in total within the boxes out of 220 households we enrolled, which have at least one campy positive in human or animals. On top of the right, within the white box, the legends are showing three different follow-ups or visits I mentioned earlier on my study design slide. First, three horizontal boxes in white are filled with MSI, which stands for mother, sibling, and infant samples for 
first, second, and third follow-ups. Bottom two boxes are containing with six small boxes indicating A, which stands for animal sample. And all these small boxes are drawn in different colors like white, orange, blue, green, and red to indicate the culture and PCR results of the samples collected from the households. Within these 77 household boxes, you can see two boxes with reddish glow. One is household 63, and another one is household 179. Well, the Khan mentioned in his presentation earlier that he found similar antimicrobial resistant genes in both human and chicken samples from two houses. And these are the two houses for you. Now, to summarize the results, we found 42 campy positives in human samples and 73 in animal samples. We also can see the breakdown on the left in red color. Finally, I would like to acknowledge our donor, collaborators, authors, and each and every people involved in our study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nafis. And so I will start with the next talk. And that is from Daniel Phillips from Swansea University. Hello. My name is Daniel Phillips and I'm a PhD candidate with Swansea University investigating what causes the underlying seasonal patterns observed in Campylobacter infections in commercial broiler chickens. Campylobacter is an internationally important gut pathogen responsible for more foodborne illnesses reported in the EU than any other organism. It is primarily zoonotic with most cases originating from chickens and its incidence occurs in a stark seasonal pattern internationally. Most cases occur in warmer months. Avara Foods Limited has funded the research being presented here into finding causative factors which vary with season, with the aim being to use this information to find new biosecurity measures to keep their chicken flocks uninfected. To do this, we conducted a time series study on 11 farms supplying Avara, monitoring one chicken house on each daily for the presence or absence of Campylobacter. Each farm was extensively surveyed before and during each production cycle to gather associated metadata such as average bird weight, house construction type, ventilation and heating system, internal and external temperature and humidity, precipitation, feed type and rate of culling. Campylobacter detection was conducted by collection of a boot sock swab of the litter within each chicken house and tested via real-time multiplex qPCR with primers for Campylobacter 16S, Hippo for C. jejuni and Glyae for C. coli giving a rough quantification and speciation along with presence absence. We also conducted a second phase study on a subset of four farms, expanding the initial testing to incorporate outdoor boot socks to monitor for environmental Campylobacter. The data collected from both phases was analyzed using general additive models and survival analysis to determine if there was any impact from each recorded parameter on the presence of Campylobacter within each flock. We found that most production cycles were Campylobacter positive, with infections beginning close to the end of the cycle, with some farms being far more likely to be positive than others. Once positive, flocks rarely became negative again. There was no impact from season or from any seasonally affected parameters, on the age at which the birds became infected, which was consistent year-round. Detection of environmental Campylobacter was uncommon, with less than 3% of outdoor samples being positive and with no environmental detection occurring outside of an ongoing infection inside the chicken house. Internal house temperature had a significant impact on the probability of Campylobacter detection, with temperatures that deviated above the target correlating with infection. House temperature was also harder for the farmer to control late in the bird's life during summer months, which may be indicative of a heat stress effect on the chickens at the time of peak infections. Perhaps the most striking effects on Campylobacter, however, arose from the house construction. Steel clearspan houses were less often infected than wooden posted houses. Houses with biomass underfloor heating were less often infected than those with LPG overhead heaters, and reverse flow ventilation was able to hold off infections until later in the bird's life as seen in the survival analysis I had presented here. What all this suggests is that the causes of Campylobacter seasonality are probably much more complex than just a simple temperature-dependent effect. The environment surrounding the farm is not a likely source of infection, and instead certain farms are more susceptible to infection, in part due to their construction, particularly during the summer when in house internal temperature is harder to control. 
This is the most extensive study done to date utilizing a time series to pinpoint the onset of Campylobacter infection in chickens and has given rise to some useful results that we hope will influence biosecurity decisions in the future. I believe that we have uncovered some interesting routes for future research to dig deeper into the pattern seen in Campylobacter epidemiology. We do have some follow-up work planned, assessing whether there are seasonal changes within the chickens themselves using viscera samples collected from phase 2 birds at the factory, which we will be working into our analyses. Thank you very much for listening. I will now be taking any questions. Terrific. Thank you very much, Daniel. So we'll keep those questions for a little later on. We will have the next talk by Augustine. Uh, Augustine Conesa, and I'm just about to load his talk now. Well, hello everyone. My name is Agustin Conesa, and I work as a postdoc at the Instituto Soprofilatico in Teramo, Italy. And I'm here today presenting this work entitled Monitoring Antibiotic Resistance in Campylobacter jejuni from Italy in the last 10 years period from 2011 to 2021. Well, given the public health concern about uh, resistant pathogens in food producing animals and the paucity of data uh, about this topic in Italy and the growing concerns since the current classification of C. jejuni by WHO as a high priority pathogen due to the emergence of resistance to multiple drugs such as those belonging to the fluoroquinolone group, the macrolides and in other classes which limits the treatment alternatives, we saw the importance of monitoring this in the last period. This work is aimed to assess the AMR of Campylobacter jejuni isolate from domestic and wild animals and humans to identify uh, the correlation in Italian habitats between the phenotypic AMR comparing the origin of these isolates. This we study in the period that I described before, 2,734 strains. 95% of these strains were from domestic animal origin, between them 77% belong to poultry and 4% of the samples belong to human origin. Well, uh, we study the resistant phenotypes of these isolates, determined uh, using the microdilution method with EUCAS breakpoints for the most um, clinically relevant antibiotics according to literature that are nalidixic acid, ciprofloxacin, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, gentamicin, streptomycin, and tetracycline. Well, the first result that we got is the global proportion of the, uh, all of the years. And then we have the, the completely susceptible strains uh, and the resistant profiles was very similar between domestic animals and humans with 60 to 70 percent of totally uh, sensitive strains, while uh, in wild animals the, uh, we found a significantly higher prevalence of 95 percent of totally sensitive strains. Uh, well, it, so we, ha we can see that we have a very similar profile between domestic animals and humans and very different to the what we found in wild animals that never use or not that frequently use a antibiotics. So then we study the trends of each antibiotic in timelines during the de last decade and in this we found that the fluoroquinolones, the uh, ciprofloxacin, nalidixic acid and tetracycline, the three of them have very similar profiles we have a higher resistant profile since 2011 with a stable trends in time in the last 10 years. Conversely, erythromycin, that's another clinically relevant antibiotic, show a, also a, a lower number but also a resistant pattern and a, also stable in time. So that's taken account. Uh, as we said, most of these were collected by poultry, so this is the most important group. And in this group, we can see the importance of the resistance in these antibiotics that we see the most common uh, resistant patterns that are ciprofloxacin, nalidixic acid, and tetracycline. And we can see that these patterns, of course, not the same numbers, but the same tendency, is starting to show in the human population too over the years. And uh, in another case is erythromycin that, as I said, is another antibiotic where we see the starting of the resistant 
a pattern in poultry, most of all, we can also see this in the swine, uh, swine group. And we are, this is starting to show in the last years in humans. So this is to take in account, as I said before. Uh, well, the fact that the humans isolates are uh, reproductive, uh, reproduction the same patterns that we have in animals is reinforcing the direct association between the increase in the resistant profiles over the time with veterinary practices in control of pathogens in birds. So this is an important topic to, to watch and to monitor. Well, besides this, we have uh, to remark the importance of the multiple resistant groups, since almost 70% of the resistant strains show this ability to three or more antibiotics. Uh, well, being um, the most common combination, the group that we described before, that is ciprofloxacin, nalidixic acid, and tetracycline, and the same group with erythromycin being 44 and 18 percent respectively. Uh, so, as we can see, the antibiotics released in animal uh, production uh, environments can interfere with the development of the resistant profiles. Resistant profiles. A, well, a better knowledge of the resistant levels of CJ Juni is necessary and mandatory monitoring uh, the profiles and of the AMR of this species in different animal production, and this is suggested from the further periods. Thank you very much. Uh, I leave you. I will be here for questions after the session, and in, in any case, I give you my contact information. So feel free to contact me if any questions pop up further in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Augustine. And so we are on to our last uh, speaker of, our, um, of this session, and that is Francesca Morota. I will now share that presentation, and after that, we'll do the questions. So we're starting to move a little towards that public health side um, with longer trends over time. Good afternoon, my name is Francesca Marotta. I'm pleased today to talk to you about uh, the genomic surveillance of Campylobacter in Italian poultry. Poultry, poultry is a natural reservoir of Campylobacter and it is well known that most of the human cases are linked to undercooked poultry or to an incorrect handling of raw meat. The aims of this study were to monitor the spread of Campylobacter jejuni and coli genomic variants isolated from poultry and antibiotic resistant genes carried by the circulating clones. In particular, we wanted to identify changes that occurred in Campylobacter population in Italy over time, and so we focused on the strains collected in two different time periods. World genome sequencing on 386 Campylobacter jejuni and 166 Campylobacter coli collected during two collection periods was performed. Genomes were typed by MLST, anchor genome MLST, in rhythm sex sphere and the AMR genes and point mutation conferring antimicrobial resistance were identified using abrogate and point pander. Genotypic analysis revealed high diversity among Campylobacter strains examined. MLST identified 68 sequence type, Campylobacter jejuni sequence types, and 39 Campylobacter coli uh, sequence type. Among those, uh, approximately 19% and 8% of the sequence type were shared by Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli collected in 2008 and eight years later. The most common sequence type assigned to Campylobacter jejuni were sequence type 2116 and 2863, while for Campylobacter coli, sequence type 832 and 
59 were most frequently found. This slide show, shows geographic distribution of Campylobacter jejuni and coli divided by their MLST clonal complexes. We found that the same MLST types uh, for Campylobacter jejuni were present in different farms across the territory and uh, uh, often both MLST clonal population coexisted in the same locations. The presence of BAS clones suggests that the supply chains of various producers are linked, facilitating the circulating and spread of Campylobacter clone in poultry population. So, we analyzed the Incogenome MLST, a total of uh, 255 strains uh, isolated from different sources, identified with the sequence type 2116. As you can see, with the exception of the strains from the wild, the others are all closely related, including, including those uh, coming from humans. However, its fundamental correlate molecular epidemiological data with epidemiological clones um, to understand, to better understand the dynamic of infection. This uh, last slide shows the temporal trend of these two clones on the national territory. They have both been present since 2008. However, the sequence type 2116 appears expanded when compared to the other one. Furthermore, both are prevalent in isolated poultry strains. Finally, molecular screening of antimicrobial resistant determinants revealed the predominance of Teto gene present among tetracycline resistant isolate CMA, A, B, C, and R genes responsible, uh, responsible of pump efflux mechanism and OXA61 encoding beta lactamases. My conclusion. Our study shows the presence of two Campylobacter jejuni clones geographically restricted to Italy, suggesting that there is an urgent need for more targeted intervention at the broiler production. Reducing our Campylobacter level in the primary production chain is an essential step to limit the contamination in the environment and consequently in food and therefore prevent infection in humans. The high similarity between the human and the Italian poultry isolates shows the potential of co-genome MLST analysis in, in identifying possible cross-border transmission. And in the future, we have to apply genome-wide association studies to understand specific characteristics of the succulents that lead to the expansion of the clonal population in Italy. Finally, I want to thank all the people who have contributed to this work I, and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Do we have the speakers present? Nefes, are you with us? Yeah, I am here. Thank you. Oh, good to hear. Um, so we've had a question asking, um, did you find that the mothers and siblings um, with Campylobacter had diarrhea? So were they symptomatic or asymptomatic? Well, not yet. Not we are also searching for that actually, but not yet. The diarrheal case is not. Okay, and and one further question has come in. Um, do you have plans to do genome sequencing on the strains that you've collected and do? Uh, multi-comparisons between obviously the different households and the different uh, sites of isolation? Yeah, we have. Actually, we have the plan to add, sequence at least a few of them, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, right, moving on to uh, Dan. So, um, then we have a question from uh, Tom, Tom Wilkinson. Which of your findings do you believe may have impact for the chicken industry and may also inform future guidelines? Um, 
I believe my findings relating to house construction probably um, could possibly, you know, encourage modernization of some of the older farms, which have got 40 or 50 year old houses. OK, there's a follow up question linked to that, which is from um, Fran. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Wondered if you had any ideas why differences in campy levels are seen between different housing construction, e.g. the steel versus wood. I imagine each parameter, such as ventilation, heating, etc., has its own factors to play. But in the example given there of wooden versus steel, um, I imagine that the wood probably has a lot more uh, grain and texture and things and joins where bacteria are capable of hiding to evade um, disinfection during clean during turnaround during the cleaning during turnaround. Uh, one of the things we found is that certain species of Campylobacter tend to reoccur on certain farms. If a farm has C. coli, it tends to be C. coli the next time around as well. So my hypothesis at the moment is that certain strains appear to be endemic to the, ha to the chicken house and reoccur in the next production cycle. Okay, and um, a further question from Desi. Um, <laughs> If you're able to in, in, a, in a minute or so, could you expand on the method of boot sampling? Yeah. You could just describe that. So what we would do is we would provide uh, boot socks to the farmers, which are essentially hair nets you wear on the outside of your Wellington. Um, we would ask the farmer on the first welfare check of the day to wear it on, the out, on, on their Wellington, walk up and down the chicken house, doing their routine jobs and then put it in a seedable plastic bag for return to the lab for P QPCR testing. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Augustine. We have one from uh, Arnu, the Dutch scientist who's just left us, I'm afraid, but we'll answer the question anyway, which is, um, uh, those are very high resistance prevalences, not good, exclamation mark. What is known about antibiotic usage? Are you there? Unfortunately, um, that's quite choppy. We can yes. continue that on Discord, maybe. Yeah, so I think we'll um, we'll continue those on. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to look at two different screens here. Okay, we'll, we'll continue that one on Discord. There's one further one coming for. Um, uh, Daniel, were you able to determine the impact of barn structure on insect presence, for example, flies? Um, one thing that we did do was we used an air sampler machine which drew air through a filter. We did see a handful of insects in those. We didn't really see many insects over the course of the project, and I couldn't really comment on that. Okay, thank you. And Ozan's uh, posted a link in Discord that I'm sure all of you will find interesting to go and read if you haven't done so already. I think, Nicole, that covers all of the questions that we've had in, if we want to move on to the next session.